my pleasure to introduce first Dr. Paul Offit, and you're supposed to come up here as I introduce you. <laughs> See, he listens to me. Dr. Offit is the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases and the director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Now, all of you in this room no doubt know and have probably read uh, Dr. Offit's books. They're wonderful. We wish more people would read them. But he's also the, the co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine, which is recommended for universal use in infants by the CDC. And he was the scientific technical advisor for Invisible Threat, the movie you're about to see. So it's a pleasure to welcome you to Bear County, even though I'm the county judge of Harris County. Nelson Wolf will forgive me for this. I'm sure he will. Uh, the other person that I'm very pleased to introduce is, is Lisa Possard. And reading her biography uh, was kind of interesting. What jumped off the page, people list all the things they've done. And what jumped off the page, you were really the PTA president? That's real politics, right? I mean, what Representative Howard and I engage in, that's nothing compared to PTA-type politics. But she has been an advocate, and she's been able to combine her talent of filmmaking with her advocacy. And her first film won international acclaim for teaching tolerance and anti-bullying. That's critical. And it did it by going back in the lessons of history, namely the Holocaust. And then their second film documents hunger in the U.S., which, frankly, a lot of people would like to deny that that exists also, but it does. And that has been used as for an advocacy campaign with Feeding uh, America. Now, one other note, and I don't know why she's not here, and you are, but according to this, uh, Lisa is the mother of three teenagers, and it's actually her oldest daughter who wrote Invisible Threat. Is that correct? correct. How old is she? She's 20 now. She's 20 now. So sometime we're going to get to meet the, the young woman who actually wrote this. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Paul Offit and Lisa Passard. And I think you're supposed to sit right here. Is that right? And I'm. And you two can leave, and I call Tracy back up, right. but I'm not going to let Tracy off easy either. <laughs> Hearing what you talked about in the fact that your advertising career and all you were saying about Madison Avenue gave way to public service, that's a good thing. And the reason is, not only are you a great public servant, because instead of watching mad men, we would now all be watching mad women <laughs> had you survived. So, Tracy, I turn the podium back over to you. Okay, so um, as Judge Emma said, if what just happened a little while ago were the trailers, then what's about to happen before we view the film, we think about uh, Turner classic movies, right? And before the movie comes on, you get a chance to kind of get a peek behind what's going on. So how many of you have actually had a chance to see the film that we're about to, sh to show, Invisible Threat? Okay, not many of you, terrific. So, so what's wonderful here is we have an opportunity to get our thinking framed as we go into it with people who are intimately connected to it and then some reflections coming out as we go into conversation because one of the most important things we're gonna do over the next couple of days together is, has already been alluded to, well, it hasn't been alluded to, it has been directly stated from this podium tonight. We are going to delve deeply into the evidence and the data that supports immunization policy that is the best policy that can happen to protect the health of not just Texans, but people across the country. And one of the most powerful ways that we're gonna do that is through story. And you're going to see that story in different ways. Sometimes that story is going to look like a PowerPoint presentation. It's going to look very familiar to you from conferences you've been at before. But sometimes that story is going to come in very different ways. And tonight, we have a very exciting way to engage with the evidence and the data in a compelling way 
through story, which is the first way that we were ever compelled as human beings to do anything is through story. And we're also gonna have an opportunity to engage in powerful conversation around it that leads us into action. And when I say powerful conversation, that's just not your grandfather's question and answer. It means that we're going to get engaged in the work, the true work of powerful conversation with the folks up here after the film. Remembering that the word conversation at its Latin root means to change together. The result of our conversation after this viewing should be we all walk out of here different people and able to do different things. So to start us out in framing the conversation, I'm gonna ask Lisa, tell us a little bit about how this film came to be. We were approached, is this on? We were approached by uh, local Rotarians who asked us to do a schoolhouse rock um, explanation of how the immune system works and how vaccines work within the immune system. Ooh, controversial. <laughs> the teenagers said, no thanks. Um, because of the success of our previous films, we now were getting pitched all sorts of films and this was just not that interesting to them. The Rotarians came back to us several times and it wasn't until a vaccine preventable illness affected one of the kids' family members that they decided, oh, wait a second. So because somebody else isn't immunizing, some, someone I care deeply about got this vaccine preventable disease, um, and that's what started off the whole thing. Now, this was supposed to be just a 10 to 15 minute project, real easy, until a local newspaper ran a story that said, the word vaccine in the title of what our next project was going to be. And a prominent anti-vaxxer blogger gave a review of this film as though it had been made and as though she had seen the whole thing. Now, there is no better way to interest teens than to upset them. <laughs> And that's exactly what happened, and it turned into a full-fledged documentary, and they just wanted to go for it. Great. So you talk about you know, becoming popular with some of your previous films and then being pitched a number of things. Dr. Offit, you probably know a little bit about becoming popular around a certain topic and then being pitched a whole bunch of things. What made you want to engage with this project? I'm sure you're asked to do a whole lot of stuff. What made this project important to you? I guess. <laughs> Oh, um, a little outing on the stage. I love that. Yes, you, you said, you yeah, said I guess what, what I, I um, liked about this was that um, it was high school students who sort of, it, it kind of had this uh, emperor's new clothes feeling, which is that they were going into it not quite sure what it was they were going to find. And, and like all young people, um, they were able to cut right to what was the evidence and, and were able to prevent, provide it ultimately in a uh, really compelling way. But it, it just, it has that sort of discovery feeling that I thought was really, really nice. So that's what I liked about it. And also one thing to just follow up on what the judge said in terms of Ebola virus, because I can't help myself, is I think the best description of, of the relative risk of Ebola virus is you're actually more at risk of being married to Kim Kardashian than, than of dying of Ebola in the United States. But. This, okay, so now you have to keep the microphone after that comment, okay? <laughs> so we talked a little bit about how the film came to be and your involvement with it, Dr. Abed. So tell me a little bit about kind of how did you come to be? I mean, here you are, you're, uh, you're, uh, I'm sure you had a lot of work in your day job, and all of a sudden now, not all of a sudden, but over the course of time, you really have become sort of the face, the champion, the lightning rod, a firebrand for this issue. How, how did that evolve? How did that come to be? I guess for, for there, there, um, once in, in the early 80s, when, when I guess Barbara Lowe Fisher sort of founded what was then Dissatisfied Parents Together, and which became the National Vaccine, cynically named a National Vaccine Information Center, I, I, there were a lot of people that, that started to comment on this. But I, I guess what um, upset us a little bit at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia was that we didn't see many basic scientists out there commenting commenting on this, and I thought that that was a voice that should be out there. I mean, if people bring up issues about formaldehyde or aluminum or too many vaccines too soon, I thought it was good to have someone who was a basic scientist, immunologist, virologist, and there were a number of people in our group that were that, that, that I thought should be part of the conversation. That's really what got us in. Terrific.
So we're gonna cue the film in just a little bit, but before we do, Lisa, just help frame our thinking a little bit about this. We know, like you said, it started out to be, you thought it was gonna be 10, maybe 12 minutes, it turned into 40. I am sure that there are many more hours of story that could be told here. So for you, in the 40 minutes that people are going to see, they're gonna see one story, but help us understand some of the story behind the story that they're going to see. What are some of the things that you would want them to know about what they're going to see here that you couldn't necessarily capture in that 40 minutes, but is important to ground their thinking as they're watching? Well, one of the things that I think is important to note is that we um, spoke to many, many um, parents who were vaccine hesitant and who, and many parents who were actual anti-vaccine activists, and the two were different. There are also different types of parents in their worry buckets. And you'll meet two vaccine hesitant parents. Um, one of them is a little more active than the other, the other. But some of the things that were brought up, um, there are those that worry about toxins. There was one of the mothers who was convinced uh, vaccines had caused her child's autism because she said she saw Jenny McCarthy and she just knew that that's what it was and she hopped on the bus and went to the Green Year vaccine rally. Um, the other mother talked a lot about conspiracy theories, including the whole Mayan calendar thing that was gonna be coming up in a few years. So it was really very interesting how these different worry buckets, we also heard from people who were concerned about um, bioterrorism. There was just so many different concerns and there was way too much to put into a 40 minute film. This film was actually created for, as a peer to peer documentary, which all our films are. This has turned into a very, very different film and we had no idea that there was a need for a vaccine 101 for adults. Um, I was, we were very surprised about that and really surprised when um, hospitals started using it. The American Academy of Pediatrics in Northern California uses it for residents to, tr not that they don't need, that they need this, the, not for the science information, but for the vaccine hesitancy information and how to counsel past that. It's now in 14 school districts, which we never published the actual school districts. Um, and uh, now 80 universities which are using it for their students, student health, um, some epidemiology classes. So there's lots of different ways of using the film and the film is available um, for you and we give screening license for free. Um, you just pay the cost of what it costs us to ship you the film basically. Uh, so that's what I would just give you and there's a lot of questions in there that go unanswered um, and it's fast paced because if it isn't fast paced, then the first thing a teen does is, get, is gets out their smartphone. Mm -hmm. So you'll miss some stuff, but and you'll see, you know, that there's some questions that are deliberately not answered. And never once in the film do we say go get your vaccines because that's the last thing a young person wants to hear is some, as the kids have often said, last thing you want to hear is some old white guy in a British accent in a documentary telling you what to do. <laughs> so hope you like the film. So after the film, we're gonna have an opportunity to engage with them in a powerful conversation. We are gonna join you down here in the audience as we view, so you're watching for the ways that this film, well, actually you're watching for the new vanguard of vaccine preventable champions creating and delivering to us this beautiful film, Invisible Threat. Cue the film. <laughs> 